Caleb, to get us started, give me two truths and a lie, please. The truth is that I make some of the best guacamole on the planet of Earth. I am mm. a black belt in guacamole. I hone my skills in the restaurants of northern New Mexico, and I don't know if I've ever had it better. That's the truth. Uh, another truth is that uh, I like riding sideways. I'm a longboarder, snowboarder. You know, the longer the board, the steeper the terrain, the steeper the hill, the happier I am. Uh, that's an absolute truth. And um, a lie is that uh, uh, I figured out money completely. I know all the answers. And if you ever have any questions about what to do with it, how to make it, where to keep it, I have all those answers. That's an absolute lie. <laughs> I love it. You're getting close, though. I'm getting close. It's a never ending journey. Learning about money is a lifelong, lifelong journey. And I'm still on the road and I probably will be until I'm no longer on the road. Well, I mean, what's going to happen is once you figure it out, then they'll invent something new that you didn't even realize, like cryptocurrency. Yep. The crypto crypto of uh, the next century. I can't wait for it. Or, or, or something like that. I like it. Well, one of these days I will get to try that guacamole in the uh in the cocina de silver or what was that did, did did you have a name for the kitchen last time? Um I don't know if I did but I've worked in many kitchens but I almost started a burrito truck called Bubby's Burritos for breakfast burritos um not long before I came to uh to Investopedia but I think the world is a better place that I am not running a food truck and I'm in a happier place that I get to be the editor in chief of Investopedia. But it could have been very different. I could have been doing financial advice while wrapping you a breakfast burrito on Sixth Avenue in Midtown yeah. Manhattan, battling it out for space among the many good food trucks there. But I think I put, I wound up in the right spot. Yeah, that's that's probably true. I love it. Well, it's always good to talk to you. What is what is top of mind for you right now? I've been thinking about the things that I think about when I think about money. What does that mean? I think about money all the time and it's not just, am, am I going to have enough or am I putting it in the right place or how do I make more? I think about my relationship with money a lot and I talk about money all the time. I'm the editor in chief of Investopedia. It's a super job. Um, and I'm talking about it on TV. I talk about it on podcasts. I speak about it on conferences. I interview people about it. But when I think about the what I think about when I think about money, I think about my relationship with it and how that has developed over my lifetime, I, you know, I grew up with with means, uh, and with uh, uh, parents that had wealth, and then they didn't, all of a sudden. And then it was a constant sort of struggle to try to get it back, to get back to what that was. But having it, then not having it, and realizing how fleeting that could be, and the mistakes that people make with it, uh, when they have it, and then trying to get back to that way of living. That did a number on me, I think, psychologically, and I think it's a lot of the reason that I do what I do today. So I think, I've been thinking, I'm in my 50s now, I think about things that were going on in my teens. I started working when I was 12, 13 years old because I always wanted to control my own income. I wanted to be in charge of it. I didn't want things to happen to me. I wanted to happen to things. So I've been thinking a lot about that lately, especially the more times I'm asked to give advice, the more often I have to reflect on where I'm coming from when I talk about money. Amen to that. How old were you when your folks went through that? I was a, a teenager and it started, you know, pretty much uh, when I was 12, 13, 14 years old, when you thought the things that were absolute in your life, you know, we're always going to take a vacation. We're going to live in a nice place. What's ours is ours. Um, when you when those realities disappear and they start fading away and you have to reconcile with the fact that it was not what you thought it was or what people purported it to be to you as you're growing up, it's a big reckoning you have to do, not just in the loss of a way of life, but in a way of sort of looking at the people who who raised you, who I love. But it it it, it, it was a reckoning and we're still going through it. It's really... It's hard when when I'm presenting to a group of people and, and I'm talking about if you're not where you want to be financially, how do you make changes? Can you earn more money? Do you have to live on less money? If it's I have to live on less, 
Do I need to cut back on lifestyle? Can I take a step back, pay off debt so I could take a bunch of steps forward? Uh, but that's that's conscious. That's I am going to make those choices versus it sounds like that was the opposite for your parents. Right. They, they didn't want to make choices, wanted to be at a certain standard where they used to be, but the game had changed and they hadn't changed with it necessarily and, and accepted certain realities. And I'm not here saying I was suffering and we were boiling ketchup, but going from anything you want to, you're, we're not sure we can do, we can even, you know, put together that Thanksgiving meal this year. That's a, that's a, that was a pretty cold reality at that young of an age. So not a surprise that I started working at a young age. And now that I think about the fact that I'm the editor in chief of a financial education website, right? This is truly a position of honor and I, and I don't take it lightly and I'm grateful for it. Um, it kind of makes sense to me, but I was an art major. I was a soccer player. Um, you know, I was a, a filmmaker, a documentary maker. I, I'd never thought I'd be here, but now that I am here with the time and the wisdom to think about what got me here, I know it was because of what happened to me when I was a teenager and the lessons that I had to learn about money. What do you think that, and if this is, you could tell me if, if, if I'm, if I'm asking too personal a question, what did they do well in handling it? What did they struggle with? Um, the transparency and communication was not good. And I think some of that is shame. I think some of that is not wanting to accept reality. I think something that is, some of that is not wanting to accept a loss, um, and I think they could have done that a lot better. And then adjusting to the reality of what our what our financial life needed to be like in order for us to get through, um, they didn't want to make a lot of those adjustments. So I was making those myself by saying, I don't want to rely on them for these for a lot of the things that I traditionally relied on them for. I'm going to go out and make my own money and do it that way. Um, they kept a roof over our heads, right? They paid for my education, right? They made sure the essentials of for me to develop and start a career were in place. So again, it's not as if you know, I was bereft. I had just gone through a, a financial trauma with them and we never really processed together, processed it together as a family. And now that my parents are, you know, older and I'm older and we're dealing with their financial futures and that of my own family, a lot of it's coming back up again. So I've been thinking about the way I think about money a lot. And I think it's totally colored my career. And I think it's in a good way because I'm not trying to help people avoid these types of things. But I have conversations, George, with people all the time. I do office hours with with employees here at our company or when I go visit schools or when I talk to teachers who are have real questions about like the, not being able to make ends meet and getting themselves into the quicksand of debt and how to get out of that and making radical choices to have to solve those problems. It's so hard for people to to be able to embrace the fact that what was what once was is no longer and they have to really adjust their lives if they want to get back on track what is the hardest part of that it's there's tactical stuff i need to maybe start paying closer attention to my budget and then there's the ego that says what is yeah. everybody else going to say and think i think there's the the ego is a big part of it um I think people are exhausted when they have to think about, you know, the hard work that goes into turning your life around financially. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could be somebody, you know, who no fault of your own, a medical emergency, uh, a loss of a loved one, a loss of a job for one reason or another, a uh, divorce, you find yourself in a position that you'd never imagined you'd be in. And you have to make very radical choices and being having to accept that, I think is emotionally exhausting for people. And then there's the ego part of everybody knew me as this, and now I'm this. I used to drive a this, and now I ride a bike. I take the bus. That's hard for people to do, right? That shift to frugality, if that's what it takes. Or I used to, you know, join my friends every Saturday for brunch, but I can't do it anymore. I can't afford it anymore. And are they still going to want to be my friend? You know that people go through a lot of things, and I, I uh, it's it, as the person trying to help them and give them advice. It's also strange because I you know, don't look like a person who, who had to go through those things, but I had to have my own financial reckoning to get to this place myself. So, and I'm, you know, I'm the editor of Investopedia, so people are willing to listen to me, but I also know, like I talked to some people, you know, single moms 
um, you know, who, who went through a divorce and they're facing a financial emergency. I'm never going to be a single mom facing a financial emergency, but having, being able to help them practically, but not be able to walk in their shoes. That's hard. You know, that that's hard for me to get over, but I have to get over it because I'm here to help. I imagine when you share a little bit about your story and those experiences, it makes you more relatable and probably more yeah. effective. I, th I think it is. And it's a vulnerability and I'm willing to talk about it now for a long time. I didn't want to either. I wanted to hide the fact that this had happened in my family or I wanted to be the guy that had everything under control. You know, looks like, you know what you're doing, you know, uh, and I can look like I know what I'm doing. I go on TV all the time looking like I know what I'm doing and I know what I'm talking about. Um, and, you know, for me, it's I, I put a lot of work into that because I want to be giving you know, the right advice. I want to be sending the right message about building wealth, about avoiding debt, about living your life uh, in a financially responsible way. But most importantly, and you'll appreciate this given your career, it's helping people figure out what it costs to be them and what it costs to be the them they want to be. And how do we get from this, who I am today to that, which me and I, I want to be, or my family wants to be in the future. That's planning, but it's also education. And so I'm sitting right in the middle of a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. I wrote down mourning and the stages and the processes of, of mourning, because just going back to, if I was in a position where I was financially successful and affluent, then all of a sudden I'm not, I imagine it's a similar process as losing a loved one. It is. And, but to also realize, I think going through that, if you're you have some self-awareness like what is actually important and what isn't hmm. you know i get asked all the time i do a lot of work in public schools and, and high schools and talk to students throughout new york city and across the country and i always ask them you know to ask me any questions that they want and inevitably somebody says are you a millionaire how much money do you have are you really rich um and then my answer always is it's really not about how much you have it's about how much you keep it's not about how much you make. It's about what you keep and how you can grow that money over time. But if you ask me what my most important, most valuable assets are, it's my friends and my family. I've had friends for, for 45 years who are still some of my tightest people. And that, you know, you can't put a price tag on that. So, you know, went from flying first class and maybe getting picked up in a stretch limo to, you know, you know, 36 B by the restroom in the back of the plane, um, you know, for both flights and, and figuring it out. Now, again, first class problems. I understand that there are people dealing with a lot worse, but, you know, being able to actually understand what's valuable in your life, that takes a long time for people to, to come around to. And luckily for me, I had the financial trauma at a younger age where I learned those lessons pretty quickly, but I also learned the value of hard work and what it means to, you know, to earn your keep and then have your keep start working for you. I think that that's, that's, that's really powerful. And just how you started our conversation, thinking about what you're thinking about and contemplating what's valuable, what, what matters to me. Is that an obvious thing for people that, that is that obvious that we should be asking ourselves that question? I just feel like, like I certainly didn't in, until I started asking myself that question. Yeah, uh, it, it is, but it takes people a long time to come around to it. Look, I went to, uh, I went to a, a, a private college in upstate New York. Uh, I had a great education. I was a soccer recruit. I didn't have the grades to be there, but I had the, the skills uh, to be there at least to get in. Uh, and I was around a lot of wealthy people with the houses in, you know, uh, um, you know, Montauk or Cape Cod or the ski houses in Telluride and Aspen. And, you know, we came, I came from family that looked like it was going on that, was on that path and then wasn't, not at all. Um, so being around, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak, isn't easy. Or in my case, keeping up with the Chads, the Brads, and the uh, Theodores, the Thirds, that wasn't so easy because you were around wealth and you were around, um, you know, generational wealth where they had played the game, whatever that game was, that right way and had built wealth and weren't experiencing, you know, financial trauma or the authorities coming to your house to seize assets. Like it was different and wanting to... You know, what was it like to be in that family where you didn't have to think about those things? That's tough, 
for a lot of people. And as a teenage, as a teenager in America, you know, in the late eighties, you know, it was, it was intense and I'm sure it's no easier now, especially with social media, everybody's flaunting, uh, they're dripping their bling and living their best life. And you're literally just trying to get by and afford groceries and, and afford your own apartment, you know, for the first time, if you're a young person, uh, trying to make it in this country. So it's hard. It's never been easy for people to come to that reckoning. And hopefully a lot of people don't have to go through the trauma to get there. But it's not like anybody ever taught us any of this in, in high school, George. Like we were learning trigonometry when we should have been learning, you know, good credit versus bad credit. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 exactly right. So to motivate people, to inspire people, to encourage people to start having those kind of inner dialogue, like what really does matter, what is of value to me is is a really nice car of value to me really, or is it this? How do you, how would you coach up those kids that you talk to to start thinking about that? Well, when you ask kids and my kids are no different, um, you know, what is the purpose of money? Why do you want to be rich? What is the, what is the meaning of wealth? Uh, I was just sitting with a friend of mine over lunch and I said, what is the thing that you do that makes you feel wealthy, even though you might not be as wealthy as you thought you might want to be at one point in your life? What is the thing you do that makes you feel that way? And he said, and this is a good way to think about it, I do not skimp on my health. I do not skimp on taking care of myself. There is one me, right? I feel eating healthy, working out, like that's wealth. So what is the meaning of wealth? What does it mean to be wealthy? And I think when you ask most people that question, they have a number in their head. Mm -hmm. But the number is just a number. It's the you you want to be that they haven't done the thinking about, right? And I think people need to think about that. What does that mean? Do you want money so that you can go anywhere you want on vacation, live in a sweet apartment, drive three or four different cars? Or do you want money that you so you can give money to other people? Is it a charity thing? Is it all of these things? When you think about what the purpose of money is in your life, then you can actually dial it, build backwards and get to the number. But most people say 25 million liquid and I'm good. You know, I know I'll live off the interest and I can go anywhere I want and I can fly private and all those things. It's like, okay. But what we really haven't talked about is what's the North Star in that, right? Money's just a tool for you to live the life the way you want to live, to buy your time effectively. The smartest financial planners and advisors I know, and we're friends with a lot of the same people, they say that to you. They say, money's just a tool that affords you the ability to buy your time, to do with what you want. So what is it that you want? That's the question people need to ask themselves, the people who are trying to build wealth. And there are plenty of people that we know and plenty of people we don't know that are not just trying to build wealth. They're trying to get out of debt. So get out of debt so that you can have a little bit more financial freedom. So you're not stressing out every month that you've missed a credit card bill or there's a note on the door about the utility bill, right? These things work both ways. What's the North Star in, in those conversations? And I don't think people examine that as much as they think about, I want to be like him or her. I want to have this number. I want to have that vehicle. I want to be able to buy that watch. Versus I want to be that person that has the ability to make those decisions without it being stressful to me. And that is a different conversation than I want to this, right? Or that it's, I, I want to be this person. And then let me find the number that, that adds up to that person. Rest in peace. Daniel Kahneman talks about Rest thinking fast and slow. And sometimes I think $25 million in a Ferrari, that's just the fast part of my brain. The slow part is what you've been talking about. What is really my North Star? It's cool that I want that stuff and it's okay, but what does it really mean to me? Right. What is the what is the purpose of money in your life? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have a family. You have three kids now too. You know, being able to give them uh, the the you know a, a life where the, it's comfortable, but they're also well fed. They're aware. They can go to good, good schools. You can take them to see the world. Um, they learn about other people. Like there's, the, you have priorities, you know, as a family, I'm sure that you think about, it and you know, all of these things cost money and you've got three kids that might want to go to college one day. I'm in the process of about to send my second off to college, thinking about that financial exchange, you know, what's worth it these days. How do we determine what's worth it anymore? Um, it's very, it becomes very interesting. That's why it's lifelong, right? 
go through these different life stages and the financial questions and the and the 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 puzzles we need to solve about the role of money in our life just become more complicated and morph into new things. I love it. Well, Caleb, I always appreciate your time and your attention. We are ready for your difference making tip today. What do you have for us? I think the thing that I keep coming back to is uh, the ability to listen, right? I was just interviewing Charles Duhigg. He wrote a book called Super Communicators. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning author, a very respected journalist and business journalist. And his book, Super Communicators, uh, it was one of the smarter books I've read in a long time. And it's about those people that we all know that have that ability to communicate at a higher level. They're black belts in communication, and they're not the best speakers in the room necessarily. They're not the leaders or the captain of the team or the CEO, so to speak, but they have found a way to find harmonic conversion in conversation because of their ability to listen and to empathize and to ask the right questions, know when to talk and know when to listen. So if you're developing a super skill, I don't care what line of work you are in, the ability to listen well and be present and be empathetic is invaluable. That will get you more than the ability to work in AI or Python program or know how to drill for oil or gold. The ability to listen well is a super skill and it will be invaluable to you in your life and career. Well, I think that that is great stuff that definitely gets to come up. I like to think about the different superpowers that we have as human beings. And I think that you could definitely classify that as a human superpower or certainly a super skill, as you said. Love it. Well, Kale, thank you so much for coming back on the show, actually coming on this show for the first time. Where can people learn more about you? Uh, how can they connect? Yeah, I am at Caleb Silver, just the way it sounds, C-A-L-E-B-S-I-L-V-E-R on all the socials. And I am the editor-in-chief of Investopedia. So at Investopedia, we are a website that's going to be 25 years old this summer, George. That's 250 real years. 25 years on the internet is 250. So we are we are a dinosaur, but we're still roaming and we're still here giving out free financial education and literacy. We will be here hopefully for another 25, but we're at Investopedia. I'm at Caleb Silver. Come one, come all. And it is always a pleasure to speak to you, my friend. Love it. If you enjoyed this much as I did, show Caleb your appreciation. Share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Find Caleb all over the internet and social media at Caleb Silver, C-A-L-E-B-S-I-L-V-E-R. And for all of your financial questions, needs, education, go to investopedia.com. Follow them on social media as well. Um, obviously, been singing their praises, not for 25 years, but for certainly a long time. So thanks again, Caleb. Thank you. Finally, a friendly reminder, there's never going to be anybody more interested in your financial success than you are. So act accordingly. <laughs>